alternative grids. So this is going to be a relatively short video. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time going into deep detail about these. I just want you generally aware of the drawbacks of the standard D-grid scheme and what some of your options are. And you can follow the references in the notes or do your own literature search to learn more about these different grid schemes. Drawbacks of the standard Yi grid. Well, one that we've already sort of alluded to is this idea of numerical dispersion. A wave traveling through a Yi grid travels slightly slower than a physical wave would. And we can see this is particularly bad for waves traveling along the Cartesian axes. So these lines are a map of the refractive index as a function of direction. So in air, for example, a physical wave would follow according to this blue line, which is a perfect circle, meaning every all directions see the same refractive index. That's not the case for a wave on a Yi grid. So what we see is that it has a slightly higher refractive index, meaning the wave on the Yi grid is traveling slightly faster. I'm sorry, slightly slower than the physical wave would. And it's worse along the Cartesian axes and actually least along the diagonals. But it actually changes. It's different in different directions. So it's an anisotropic type of dispersion. Another drawback is this is a Cartesian grid. And we have to make a staircase approximation. And so if we have curved structures, that can become a problem. Now, there's all kinds of fixes to all of these things, and we'll touch on that. But for the standard Yi grid scheme, these are the main drawbacks, the staircase approximations and the numerical dispersion. Another thing is the structure of the grid. We can do something like a non-uniform grid, which is what you're seeing here, but it's still structured. We still have these sort of straight lines and we really can't represent curved boundaries that well. Whereas if we go to some kind of unstructured grid, we can make our mesh conform to curve boundaries much better, much more accurately. And as a result, we can get away with much more coarse grid resolution than we could on a structured grid. Now it's a lot more work and set up to get a code working on an unstructured grid versus a structured grid, but that's the drawback of the structured grid. Alternative grids. Well, one option is a hexagonal grid. This is a little bit more symmetrical than a square grid, and this has been used to pretty good success. Non-uniform orthogonal grids. So we still have basically a Cartesian you know, square looking grid, but the cell spacing can change as a function of position across the grid. And so this lets us focus more of our computational resources where we need that. Here's an example of some kind of waveguide circuit. So we need a little bit more resolution here. And what you can see is that the grid spacing work, working left to right is tighter here than it is out here. Likewise, working downward, we see much tighter spacing to resolve this waveguide. And same thing here, this waveguide, we see much tighter spacing of the lines than over here. Now here's the problem though, because this is still orthogonal. Yes, we have a, a denser mesh here, but that dense mesh continues down here. We really don't need the dense mesh here, but just because we still have an orthogonal grid, we're sort of forced to. Likewise, we don't need a dense grid here or here or here, but yet we're forced to have it. So this does buy us some efficiency, but still not as good as an unstructured grid. Curve a linear coordinates. Well, now our, our mesh cells become sort of like jelly and we can conform to perfectly curved boundaries. And typically the way this is done is that we don't make every single cell in the grid curvilinear coordinates, we really just do that on ones that need to conform to a curved boundary. So in the cells immediately adjacent to a curved boundary, we would modify the update equations there to compensate for these or account for the curvilinear coordinates. Structured and non-orthogonal grids. So these are curvilinear, so the edges of these E cells are still straight, but you can see we have a, an oblique E cell. And this is really good in cases where your anisotropy dictates that, where the principal axes of the anisotropy, or maybe the principal axes of your lattice, your photonic crystal, your metamaterial, 
is not some kind of orthorhombic geometry, but something oblique, in which case using a grid like this can buy you a lot of efficiency. Then we can combine the best of everything and have irregular, non-orthogonal, unstructured grids. Um, these are great. These can account for everything, but it's a lot of work to set this up. And when it comes time to parallelize and put on a GPU, sometimes the generalizations you have to make to your code don't accommodate that as well. So sometimes just a stupid, simple code would go on a GPU very quickly, very very much much more easily than putting all this other all these other fixes in. Then there's bodies of revolution. This is very commonly used. Sometimes we have devices that have some kind of rotational symmetry. And I got some examples on the next slide. And so we can develop our codes in cylindrical coordinates. And this is hugely efficient and this is done a lot. Here's some example devices. So Let's say we wanna do waveguide bends. This is something very efficiently handled in cylindrical coordinates. Maybe we have a cylindrical shape waveguide. Uh, that can be a metallic waveguide or optical fibers also have cylindrical symmetry. Dipole antennas, if we're ignoring the feed, it's a cylinder running along this way. We have circular horn antennas. Lenses have cylindrical symmetry. Parabolic dishes have cylindrical symmetry. So there is a lot that can benefit from developing your simulation in cylindrical coordinates.